yeah, so we're just talking about how car sharing was uh, one of the first formal shared mobility um, operators in the United States um, to push the narrative of having fewer vehicles on the road uh, and greater mobility access for everybody um, and also reduced carbon emissions. Um, so we're talking about, you know, some of the new players involved, some of the, the history of car share, and also uh, of some examples of how different partnerships, public-private partnerships have worked, and also some of the future of, of uh, how, you know, some challenges, some, some successes, and, and uh, you know, things of that nature here. So um, I'm Mary Ferguson. I'm with the Shared Use Mobility Center. I'm a program manager. Um, at SUMSI uh, for the past five years. I've worked on various car, uh, car share and mobility hubs projects uh, throughout California. And um, before I introduce the panel, uh, can I have Marco uh, come up here? And I will pass over my mic. Um, oh, you got one here. Yeah. Yeah, there. Does it work? Wait. Oh, there you go. Perfect, perfect. Uh, hi, everybody. And uh, uh, as you maybe know, this panel is sponsored by the Car Sharing Association. I'm Marco Viviani, I'm Vice President at Comunoto. Comunoto is the oldest car sharing company in, in, in America, and still existing, I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and the largest in Canada. And <clears throat> we are a founder of uh, the Car Sharing Association. You know, when, when we started car sharing uh, 28 years ago, uh, few believed that we could have, have a relevant impact on, on cities. And uh, now, almost 30 years after, you know, we have several organizations and cities that provide thousands of car sharing cars in, in city with a viable model. And I insist about viable because, you know, now in the, in the narrative as we're speaking about other kind of share mobility that, you know, it, it could be, you know, it's kind of <laughs> inspired by car sharing. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, as Zipcar is doing in here in US, or we are doing Canada, or mobility in Switzerland, go get in Australia. So we have still a lot of way to go, but uh, there's a part of the recipe of the success until now, and that we believe it will be a part of the success in the future, that is the wish that we always had to share experience and knowledge between uh, each other in the industry. And, and this is the make great mission of the Car Sharing Association and the reason why we associated with the Shared Used Mobility Center to uh, host this panel. So thanks to the center for this and have a great panel. Thank you so much, Marco. So I'm just going to do a round of introductions here on our panel. So I will start uh, immediately to my left here. Uh, so we have Justin Holmes, who is the head marketing, uh, head of marketing and public policy at Zipcar. Uh, we also have another Justin, Justin Romeo, who is the director of special projects for New York City's DOT. Um, to his left, we have uh, Peter Crahenbuehl, uh, who is the CEO of Colorado, uh, Colorado Car Share? And to his left, we have Arne Batzner, who is the member of the Board of Directors for Mobility Car Sharing. Um, so, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, so, I'm just going to start this off, and then we're just going to have a bit of a kind of an organic conversation going here, and then maybe some time for some QA at the very end. So, um, you know, one of the, the questions uh, that I wanted to ask, you know, something that we sort of talked about as a group previously was, um, what does it take to make car sharing permanent in different regions and how to adjust for that with changing trends, uh, like micro mobility that comes in and sort of disrupts that? Um, so, if, uh, yeah, just uh, I'm not sure who might want to start with, uh, with that, but uh, that's the first question. Yeah, I'm happy to start. And thank you uh, to SUMSI for having us here today. And thank you to the Car Sharing Association for sponsoring um, this panel. Um, again, Justin Holmes from Zipcar. Um, for us, you know, Zipcar is now 22 years old in North America. So Kaminato had us 
beat in entering the North American market by a couple of years, um, but we've reached a fair amount of scale. And I will say we've learned an awful lot of lessons during that time about what it means to take shared mobility and make it permanent in a number of cities. You have to have deep operating capabilities. You need to understand your value proposition and acquire members. But I would say probably the X factor that has really contributed to our success is partnerships uh, and working really closely with the cities where we operate to ensure um, that we are a vibrant part of the mobility ecosystem where we operate. Great example of that is in New York, um, where we have a very strong partnership that Justin and I uh, can talk about uh, a little bit later. But um, I think that's been a really important part of our success uh, to ensure that car sharing is well positioned against other personal mobility options like car ownership, located on the curb and highly visible areas where it's easy for our members to access. That's been a very strong catalyst of our growth and having a great strong relationship with the cities where we operate has been super important to us as we've looked uh, to deepen our presence uh, and make a really lasting impact on the cities where we operate. So um, uh, my name is Arne Betzner from Mobility Car Sharing in Switzerland and uh, also here, thanks for SUMSI for bringing us all together and totally delighted to see everybody again after these difficult two and a half years. So um, I'm very much happy to be here and uh, thanks for having me. Um, I can only second very much what uh, Justin just said. It was like a car sharing 101 that you presented in a sort of, and uh, one, one thing that I'd like to add is policy. Um, what I observe is that not only in shared mobility, also in transit, all major questions in the uh, um, mobility industry, if I may call that one, the mobility ecosystem, are morphing themselves into policy and governance questions. And why I'm saying this is um, because also as operators or as PTOs who incorporate car sharing into transit systems, which in my eyes, it should be in Switzerland, we refer to as, as, as self-drive transit. So these things that stand there are not cars, they are self-drive transit vehicles, basically. And the important thing on all those matters is that on the political front, uh, you be understood and that policymakers know very well what the asset is there and how the society and how the communities win by taking cars off the road, which in my eyes is the single biggest thing that car sharing can do to that. I mean, we calculate with 1 to 11. Susan Shaheen from Berkeley advances numbers of 1 to 18 in terms of substitution rates of uh, of private vehicles by car sharing vehicles. So it depends on the local market. Every market is different. It's one something we've learned. We are celebrating 25 years this year when we're having it with the celebrations. So uh, it's quite a bit of experience that comes together there. And uh, again, let's um, let's think together. Let's use this panel to think how this industry will, will look in the future. Thanks, Arndt. All right, so we got uh, 28 years, 22, 25. I'm gonna throw my hat in at 23 years with uh, Colorado Car Share. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, our approach is that we have a slightly different model in that we're a small local nonprofit. So similar to what Art was saying here at the end, we were very much mission driven. Um, and really our whole mission is around getting single occupancy vehicles off the road. So there's an entire education advocacy and outreach side of our business model that is not based on being a car share operator, but on the operational side of it, we are a car share operator. Um, the partnerships are huge, as uh, Justin mentioned. I think for us, a, another big sort of um, connectivity point with partners is the uh, other connected uh, transit options that folks have. So ever since the beginning, we have been very focused on partnering with, um, and also the social equity side, partnering with affordable housing, for example, with housing authorities ensuring that all of our locations are connected to bus stops, train stations, now obviously more recently micromobility options, walking, biking, et cetera, and staying really focused on that. And then the other uh, component and, and you know, somewhat of a benefit that we have in, and we're in the, the Denver Boulder metro region, is um, having those partnerships that in some cases, um, I wouldn't say it's necessary, but it's helpful if you're a nonprofit to have those uh, foundations and grants and some of those funding partnerships where we uh, definitely operate like a business on the car share side, but as a nonprofit, we also can diversify our revenue and focus on some of those other revenue streams that can result in like, for example, hugely subsidized car share rates in affordable housing communities. Hi, and yes, um, again, thank you very much to everyone for having us here at the panel today. 
Um, I'm Justin Romeo again from the New York City Department of Transportation. And um, I'm a little bit of the, the younger guy to the group. Like I've been involved with the department for going about four years now, working on the car share program. And, um, you know, I think for, it's, it's going to sound maybe a little ironic, but I think the thing that I would highlight that's important for kind of getting the programs of permanency is resiliency and just like understanding that kind of to, so to Justin and also Arne's point, like to the policy and also the partnerships, they take time. Um, there's a lot of detail that needs to go into, you know, getting these things like actually passed. And so I know working very closely like with key council members to get the laws in place that we needed in New York City to make the program like be able to operate and also be able to flourish. Like it has been um, a, a lot of kind of on the ground and like very detailed work. Um, but I think the key is just to continue to, to push at it um, because it does have real value. And I think being able to show that value through sort of data, through sort of the studies and things that we've um, talked about here, it's, it's also really important for being able to um, sort of continue to, to, to help us continue on that, that path of resiliency. Thanks so much. Um, great. So, yeah, just so in terms of, you know, just going beyond just making this <coughs> car sharing permanent, um, when it comes to public-private uh, collaborations, uh, what's been your uh, experience with that? And what's, what's worked well and what have been some barriers um, with those public-private partnerships? I'm happy to start. Um, you know, we partner with cities um, and transit agencies across North America, and we've learned certainly a great deal over those many years. Um, you know, I actually, before joining Zipcar, spent most of my career in government um, and government technology, and so um, had the joy, I guess I'll say, of being intimately familiar with uh, government procurement uh, and how some of those rules um, often work. Uh, so I think beginning with a high degree as a private mobility operator of empathy and understanding for some of the challenges that our government partners face um, in wanting to be creative and innovative and partnership oriented, there are certainly a lot of constraints and complexities um, when government chooses to work with private organizations uh, that I think internal in mobility companies we need to understand, appreciate, and have a degree of empathy uh, towards. So I think that's probably the first lesson. I think the second lesson, and Justin hinted to it earlier, is bringing data. Um, you know, when we were first having discussions with the city of New York many years ago about partnering, you know, there was a degree of skepticism uh, that car sharing really did have in a big city like New York, the same impact that Arnd alluded to uh, that Susan Shaheen had studied for many years, that it would have the same vehicle suppression effect in a market that was already had very low rates of car ownership and high usage of transit and walkability. And so we were very forthcoming in sharing a lot of the independent research that we had conducted, a lot of the survey and activity data that we had on our members, and shared that transparently with the city so there were no secrets. Um, and that really formed the basis of trust and understanding through real data um, to give uh, the city confidence that car sharing did have uh, some of the same desired consequences um, uh, to really help the city expand its impact and multimodalism. Um, the last thing I'll mention um, is I do think it's important, particularly when partnering with government, to think about pilot programs. Um, you know, back to my first point around procurement, um, often uh, government's language for testing and innovation, which are words that we use a lot in the private sector, is really pilot. Um, so having well-defined, very specific fixed timelines for experiments, clear metrics and clear learnings can help, I think, get some real world data, some real world experimentation going um, in ways that might um, help mitigate some of the risks uh, that our public sector partners face. Uh, so being creative about pilot programs um, has been pretty effective for us as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go ahead and add on a little bit after that. I think one of the big things for me, and it's been really great working with Zipcar, is that we've had good communication. Um, even, you know, through the pilot and afterwards, we've maintained like a regular conversation and it's really helped us to understand some of the pain points from their side and also to express the pain points from our side. And the same thing with the enterprise when we were in partnership with them is that we continue to have a good um, regular sort of meeting schedule. And I think it's really important to make sure that we're sort of sharing information so we can continue to advocate for things that will help 
um, internally as a government, and then we can ask for kind of things from them as well that will really you know, help the program from, from our end, from what we're seeing. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I can add on a little bit to that. I think Justin <clears throat> with Zipcar probably has a lot more of this than I do, but um, patience and empathy <laughs> is uh, certainly one thing that I've had to learn not coming from the government sector, coming from the private and the nonprofit world, and learning how to slowly navigate those conversations oftentimes with many different departments who not necessarily communicate with each other and you know, helping to bring those, those parties and those groups together over time. And um, honestly, I think a lot of it in some ways is timing as well, because I know for myself, at least over the last five or six years, I you know, felt like I was screaming at the top of my lungs with a lot of our currently awesome municipal partners, but saying, hey, what about car sharing? You know, the, like we are in the public transit space, but we're not, from our perspective, being treated as such. So I was kind of feeling like the you know, ugly stepchild in the basement and being totally ignored for years. And then all of a sudden, um, Marco and I were talking about this earlier today that we feel like there's a, been a bit of a shift, a bit of a mental shift, and I think it has a lot to do with everything that's gone on over the last couple of years on the social equity side, on the climate side. You know, we operate in a space that's the convergence of all those things, you know, sustainable, accessible, um, socially equitable mobility for all that converges with affordable housing and climate change and resiliency and all of that, and it seems like now, for some reason, if it was a part of just building those relationships over the years, or if it's more of this larger mental shift that's occurring, we're starting to see more and more of our partners coming to us and saying, hey, why don't you apply for this grant? And you know, my response was because it was always no before. <laughs> so, but now it's, you know, the encouragement is there and, um, and the partnerships have really grown quite a bit and, and that alone has been making it uh, really a big difference for us. Well, thank you. Well, I, I guess there's a couple of very important points that we heard and I'd like to add two of them. The first is I'd like to, to second the point on outreach and advocacy. Um, a, a, as I said before, it's, it's, there's still a tremendous amount of misconceptions out there. So despite car sharing, as we heard, being, having been around locally for anything between 15 and 30 years now, um, still a lot of people mix up car, sh car sharing, ride hailing, ride pooling. You get get, get a little better out there. And the, the fact, no, and the fact. I mean, I'm I'm very happy. Ten years ago, we were sitting here as nerds. If you don't, I'm a physicist by training. So, uh, if you if you if you pardon me for the expression, but today it's great to see this mobility discourse happen at the heart of the society. Yet that brings its own kind of challenges. Mobility is an extremely complex thing, as Peter just said, um, and as Justin just said. Um, it, it, it is at the crossroads of, of, of social interests, community interests, economic interests, um, um, spatial, spatial design, territorial um, uh, interests. So there's lots of things that come together there. And a, and a good and great piece of technology where we need to understand both the past and the future. So that makes it incredibly complex. And there are lots of people in the debate, actually they join, and I don't mind them joining, but that come up with very seemingly quick solutions that aren't solutions or things that we've already discussed, we've had, we've tried. So that, makes, that doesn't make the discourse easier, and especially not on the political front, because it basically you're up against the Sunday press and the misconceptions that are sometimes carried in there. So sorry for that rant. The second thing um, that I observe is that um, the way you finance your business and the way the message with, with, with which you get out is tremendously important. And it's not about not being evil. It's about saying we want to do something good to the community. We are co-op. That certainly helps. Um, it might be a little bit on the European side that a VC-fueled um, um, initiatives with unlimited money that come in and, and sort of distort markets over 10 years without the need to ever make a profit. Um, uh, that, that, that is not very popular or is getting, is, is generally rises a lot of opposition in Europe right now if, 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 if these folks move in. And it's, it's important, while, while of some of their business models are very interesting and it's certainly when worth looking at, it's super important as an operator in car sharing say, look, this is what we need from you and this is what we bring to the table. And at the end of the day to show the projection lines and to show where it can get. Great, so 
just uh, you know, just in that regard, uh, you know, how how has engagement been done uh, with communities? Like what, uh, what particularly ones that have been underserved? Uh, you know, what, uh, how do you draw in users, and and also how do you maintain them once you get them? So what what's uh, been everyone's experience with that? Um, I guess I can start since the mic's right here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, you mentioned the point about on the underserved and underrepresented communities. You know, that's a big part of who we operate with in, in our space. So we do work very much in sort of what I'd call the free market space, but then a big chunk of what we do is focused on our mission around providing uh, affordable mobility alternatives to single occupancy use in lower income communities. Um, again, a big part of that is through our partnerships, whether it's the public partnerships, um, uh, during COVID, we launched uh, under the CARES Act a partnership with the City of Denver in order to launch electrified car sharing in underrepresented communities as a part of the recovery, resiliency, and long-term uh, sustainability effort. Um, we're about to launch another big program partnership with Excel Energy, which would be electrified car sharing again in underrepresented communities across the state. And <clears throat> a big part of what I try to do anyways in approaching these partners is ensuring from the very beginning that that level of support is there when it comes to engagement with those residents and with those communities and that we're not just dropping a car in a neighborhood and then you know hoping that uh, if we build it they will come but really first finding out if they want us to build it and then also making sure that that's a precursor to early engagement to get them on board sort of um, from the beginning likewise we have a lot of property developers that come to us, right? Because the cities are all trying to get their heads around um, parking, traffic, carbon emissions, you name it, public health issues. And so there are parking reduction ordinances in Denver, for example. And of course, when that happens, um, the developers want you to just kind of happily drop a car in their, in their development and then tick the city box and increase their profit and move on. Um, for the most part, not all of them, but a lot of them, it, it's very much a, a box ticking situation. Um, what we try to do with them is say, look, what's really important to us is the partnership. And um, as a big part of that, what level of engagement you're willing to help us provide with your residents is once uh, the car sharing program gets off the ground. So across the board, it's really, from our perspective anyways, vital to work with all of our partners to make sure that they're helping with that level of engagement. Um, once we have members, it's not an issue for us to keep them. They love us. We're, it's kind of a, a big family, a community, so to speak. Um, but in terms of getting them from the get-go, it's really a, you know, a, a collaborative, synergistic relationship that we're always looking for with any location partnership. Well, I'll, I'll be very brief this time uh, it's because it's banal and at banal at the same, t same time what I'm going to say. And it's listen to your customers, talk to them, you know, uh, understand what they want. And customers, I mean, not only those that you already have, which is basically what we all know, this avant-gardistic, green, um, middle class, upper middle class, often academic thing, but move into those communities that didn't benefit there yet. And that, that includes, for example, in Europe, in Switzerland, includes small towns. We have... Um, Every town of more than 10,000 inhabitants has at least one of our vehicles, and many smaller towns also, and many smaller communities also do have them. And we, we invest uh, a little more than half a million dollars per year to subsidize out of our cash flow, which is 80, 80 million Swiss francs on parity with the dollar. So um, it, it tells you a little bit, it's quite an investment, but it's worth because of the engagement for the communities, because of the purpose that the company has, and also because of the network effect, because we want to do to, to be people to catch the train for a long distance travel, if you can speak about long distances in Switzerland, but it's still four hours from one end to the country to the other. And, uh, but uh, but uh, we want them to, to kind of use the car sharing car really for the last mile or when they have some cargo to transport or something like that and really, really kind of integrate it into transit to have that model and serving serving the communities again and listening to what they need and developing products, you know, with co-financing or something with that, that, that I think is the way to go also for the future. If I can just add quickly, I do think there's a, a misconception sometimes about car sharing that it's for you know, people who choose to live maybe a more altruistic, low-car lifestyle. And 
you know, we find um, a significant amount of members choose car sharing because it's an affordable option for them because car ownership is financially out of reach. Um, about 40%, a bit more than 40% of all of our members are below the national median income. Um, and so it's a natural part of our value proposition. It's not, certainly it, there are times and neighborhoods and zones where you have to be very intentional about outreach and partnerships, and I can certainly talk about that. Um, but car sharing has a very high resonant value, not just among people who choose to live a sustainable lifestyle, but for whom um, car ownership uh, is, is unaffordable. Um, I'll point back to partnerships. You know, we work with a number of um, organizations around the country to help extend our footprint. One is the New York City Housing Authority, where um, today I think um, Tori Fishman from my team can correct me if I get these numbers wrong, but um, almost I think about 100 um, vehicle locations at about 20 uh, different uh, NYCHA housing uh, authority properties uh, with a great uh, co-marketing agreement with them as well as an attempt for us to help extend our reach and our footprint. Um, but it's really a core part of our business operations now. It's not necessarily an add-on or a bolt-on. Uh, it is the value that we deliver to our members, not just, again, um, choosing to live a car-free lifestyle, but providing access to people who couldn't otherwise afford it. Yeah, and I think, I think everyone made some really, really great points, and I, I, I agree with them all. And I think the, the one thing I wanted to highlight, um, I think Peter made the point, is that it's not just dropping a car in a location. It's also doing the like education and the outreach like after that car is there, and so I think what what I'm saying is like really important for um, for getting the car sharing community to sort of branch out into new places is going to those communities and making sure there's sort of continued education and engagement even after um, we we work to just get the cars there. That's that's one thing that we've taken in our program from going from a pilot to permanency is really trying to push the areas of the city that do not have, um, that do not have car share and do, but have, have not been overly active. But we saw like in some of those areas that we included in the pilot were some of the most active areas. Um, and so what we are saying is that we want to encourage um, the participants in the program to go there, but also to encourage them to continue to engage with those communities afterwards to make sure that we're getting the uptick in membership, uptick in activity, um, and continue to have some of the success that we saw in the pilot. Great. So, you know, at the beginning, uh, we mentioned how CarShare sort of led the way in terms of uh, shared mobility operation. Um, so when it comes to other transportation modes and concepts like mobility hubs, um, how do you integrate car share into that sort of model or, or with those different modes? And, and what maybe were sort of some challenges around that? I'll go ahead and just, just be pretty brief and quick. So I think for, for us, I think the thing is getting coverage. Um, so car share really operates as a, filling in the gap for many of the members in New York City, um, as uh, so like Justin alluded to, like we, we've seen definitely like larger, longer trips um, for the usage and that there's heavy sort of walking and like transit access. And so we just wanna be able to, I think for the other micromobility modes, the idea is that we would cover the city kind of in, in all of those things. So have, have scooter options, have um, like limited use motorcycle options, have car share options, and have transit options to kind of give you a bevy of things to uh, make, make use of. So it's really about just like, I think, getting as much coverage as possible for areas. I think that's, that's the key. Yeah, um, I mean, at least in our region, mobility hubs are still relatively new. They're, you know, really up and coming. So I think the answer to that question could be different in the not too distant future, but, um, it's happening, and so from our perspective, what we've tried to do is be out in front of it and it actually initiate those conversations with the municipalities um, ahead of time and saying, hey, wouldn't this be a great area? Or, you know, what are you thinking about doing here? And maybe we can pr provide some feed into that. Oh, and then sometimes the response is, wow, we'd love to have you as uh, an advisor on this stakeholder group, which works out really well. The other thing that's um, worked out really well for us, um, again, on the partnership side and what I mentioned before, which is partnering with other mobility providers who aren't in our space. So for example, in the Denver Boulder metro region, um, it kind of stemmed a little bit from frustration, I'll admit, but you know, friendly with other providers who are, operate our buses, our Accessoride transit services, 
um, our shared B cycle, uh, which does the shared bike, and um, obviously there's e scooters now. But we, you know, we were all kind of friends and having these one off conversations with each other on the side. And then um, we had an idea to bring it all together and say, hey, why don't we have our own little mobility parentheses service provider close parentheses partnership so we now have this mobility partnership literally that's what we call it and we are the service providers and our goal was twofold it was to come so the executive directors of all three of these entities come together and we talk about ways that we can work together for collective voice and collective action so now when we go to the university or the municipality or whatever it's not one little nonprofit going there and you know kicking and screaming it's like we're coming together with a unified voice as complementary mobility service providers, all of whom have similar goals around, you know, providing a social service, but also being razor sharp on sustainability and renewable energy and electrifying and all that stuff. And that has been a really good approach for us to be able to go in and talk about things like mobility hubs, for example. Well, I, I, I'll add to that, uh, that you, you, one should understand what shared mobility product has what effect in which particular market, because it's totally not homogeneous, not by country, not by continent. Um, but we see certain trends. For example, what we see that is uh, uh, these shared uh, e-scooters um, in, North, in a North American context, they would very typically, again, it's not homogeneous, I'm not talking one for all, but very often in, in grid cities, you see that they can substitute car trips of up to two miles very efficiently. Where in Europe, we see a predominance of trip generation and shifting trips away from public transit, which in very often is not exactly what you want. So this is something that you want to do. And the second thing is to differentiate uh, with the data and the research out there that we have by now um, between free floating systems where you can pick up the car anywhere and put, put it back anywhere, which so-called station based or return car sharing where you have the car um, in a special in a special setting, which is the model that I think the, the, the model that that is the most um, sustainable overall because that produces really high rates of, of car uh, suppression. As Justin said, that you don't see it necessarily in free floating or then are, there are special cases where combined models work, uh, for example, in the um, in the city of Bremen that has been doing worldwide pioneering work, Bremen, Germany, with the famous Michael Glotz Richter, who, would, who should also be here today. But um, it's, um, uh, it's important to, to understand these differences and then also to explain them again in the, in the advocacy and the outreach you're doing. And, and of course, there must be room for trialing something new. The mobility space isn't static and has never been. Uh, but it's also very important to very quickly analyze and understand from data what helps and what maybe should be improved. Uh, not everything is, is good because it's just new. Yeah, to me, I think mobility hubs are often uh, places where people make mobility decisions, where we can get some incremental benefit by clustering access, right, at its very simple fundamental level. And I think, you know, subways have been doing this for years, and we've followed a lot of mass transit. Um, so I would say, you know, we've been co-locating Zipcar adjacent to transit for 20 plus years. Um, we have active partnerships with transit agencies to co-locate even closer because we know that's where people often make transit decisions, whether it's Metro North or the MBTA or MARTA in Atlanta. We have plenty of examples of where, you know, we've been able to create you could call them organic mobility hubs because we know that's where people are making active mobility decisions. Um, and so I think that's um, pretty important um, to take a very user and member, uh, in our case, sort of centric view of mobility hubs. They don't necessarily places where we need incremental uh, infrastructure, um, but rather um, organically have emerged around places where people are already making mobility decisions. And by clustering those activities with more intention, uh, we can magnify the impact. I just wanted to add um, on one thing that I think from the government side, which is important that we're working on, is trying to have the different departments who are sort of working on the different programs, like in conversation more as well because I think that helps from a regulatory side to be thinking about, okay, how can we, how can we combine the car share work with the scooter work? Because it's not, it's not separate. It's all about people kind of getting to the places that they need to, to get to. Those are, those are our goals. So I think that's one thing we're trying to do is just have more um, sort of internal collaboration. Um, this is giving you guys a little inside look, but to make sure we're having those conversations. And then we can work with our partners outside to ensure that the, 
that the mobility hubs and that these like sort of locations of confluence of transport are happening. One last thing I'll just add on quickly about community hubs. I like to also, or mobility hubs, conceptually, I like to think of them also as just community hubs. Like, I don't know how we're going to get there, but we're, we're throwing it out there every chance we get. We're like, okay, there's affordable housing and public transit, and let's have a pizza party. And, you know, <laughs> explain to them about all of these options. So really bringing the community um, into the mobility side of hubs. Great. So, um, you know, car sharing has been around for a while now. Um, and, you know, the question is, like, how to remain resilient? So, you know, there's been quite a few changes, uh, especially pre-pandemic. There was um, some big uh, services that shut down, you know, Maven and car to go to name a couple of those. Um, so when it comes to these shifting trends, um, what are some of the lessons learned from that in terms of, you know, re resiliency and, and uh, you know, just kind of keeping car share on the map? And, and what have you found that's, that's worked well for that? I'm happy to start. I mean, I think the, um, all of us who have been in this business a while can probably attest car sharing is a tough business. Um, and I think um, building up a degree of experience um, and capabilities will um, help assure you over time. Uh, folks that, you know, some folks that have looked to enter this market um, have not done so successfully because it's, it's difficult. Um, and so I think um, that's at least one lesson that we feel confident that we built some enduring capabilities that are hard to replicate that will uh, endure in a tough market. Um, the second thing I guess I would really illustrate, and I suspect my colleagues would share this view, is that our competitor is not really each other or other mobility options. Our number one competition is car ownership. Um, and I think we need to stay focused on that. Um, mobility is a fairly complex ecosystem. Um, people's mobility choices depend um, significantly on their individual use case, where they're going, and people often choose the right trip um, for the, the right mode for the right trip. Um, I think we all in this room certainly appreciate that. But if you want a car, that really takes you out of the decision-making matrix around walking or biking or choosing other sustainable modes because that becomes your dominant mode. Um, and so I think we all need to remember uh, that as, whether it's Aaron's point around public policy or partnerships, um, our competition is car ownership um, and the things that we can do to position ourselves to make car sharing or other shared mobility options as easy, as convenient, as reliable as what people experience when they own a car uh, will position us, I think, all very well um, for the future of capturing that significant share of the pie uh, that is dedicated to car ownership today. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to second that, and and the the point is, um, it, it's it's not only as, as Justin said, not only affordability that that might be and and is definitely the case for a certain customer or for certain customer segments, but then the the whole the whole point of comfort, you know, saving you time by not having to look for a parking space, by knowing where to put that vehicle back, th that the whole process, even for for new users, new customers, is easy to understand, easy to handle. Whether you open that car with your phone or with a, with a card, whatever, it should be easy, it should be resilient, it should be robust. It's like what goes for every transit. It needs to be reliable. So you need to know that that car is there when you need it, where you need it. And quite a few folks um, that have been stiff defendants of car ownership, which was a little bit this kind of protective move, like I've got my family, I've got my job, I'm already overwhelmed with everything. So, I mean, that's like, you know, there's a lot of psychology in all this. And once you get people to trial this, and you can convince them with a, with a reliable product, then the whole comfort factor, including the cleanliness of the vehicles and everything, uh, that, that is something that can make, uh, that, that, that can make a, lo a lot of differences in the acceptance and also in the customer retention rate. But then again, we need to evolute, we need to adopt new technologies, we need to permanently question ourselves, do we serve the interests of the user well? And also, do we understand the business of our partners? It definitely helps uh, if you understand how, how to run a railway, how to run a PTA, uh, in order to know how these APIs, in the IT sense and in the more general sense, are to be defined and how to make that famous seamless experience that for the past years we've all been talking about, you know, but it's uh, then to, 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 to make a product out of it is a little bit more challenging sometimes than you would assume at first. 
Well, I, I think we could have a whole other panel session on, uh, on, on how to not become insolvent because, you know, we were on the brink several times over the last couple of decades for sure. Um, but for the sake of time and hoping to hear from you all, I'll say just uh, kicking our heels in and just not giving up at all costs. That, that's really, you know, kind of summarizes it all on our end anyways. I think everyone has touched on it on this panel at some point, but I think really being like honest and open about the value proposition that car share brings to communities and to people like that. I think that is key to um, stick around. It's just, um, I think something that we should just continue to, to yell from the mountaintops and to make sure everyone is like getting it. Um. Thank you so much. Uh, so I know all the panels started a little bit later today, so we do have a little bit of time for some Q&A, maybe for another five minutes. So uh, if you just show a raise of hands and I could just pass around the mic. Hi, my name is Great Newcomb. I'm the Director of Partnerships for Mobility Data. We're the nonprofit organization that governs through consensus GBFS. Um, Justin, to your point, as far as competing against the single-use vehicle, that is at the core of our mission is to provide um, traveler, improved traveler experience through high quality data in journey planning. So with that in mind, we in fact recently added car sharing to our extension. Um, so with that in mind, I'd love to hear your perspective on data and how that plays a role both operationally and also in your analysis and planning. I would say, at least in, in Zipcar's case, data plays a role in literally everything that we do. Um, we have um, where we place our vehicles, how we partner with government, how we understand and manage our business on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in terms of the kind of third-party sort of data integrations and partnerships, it's certainly something that um, you know we're open to and explore. Um, we share data proactively with a lot of our partners, like um, New York City, um, and I know there is certainly a tremendous amount of activity in the data sharing space. You know, the, the one thing that we are often cautious about, uh, particularly as a membership network, is our members have placed a significant amount of trust in us. Um, and so we want to ensure that when and as we share data, that we don't violate and break that trust um, in any way. And I think that's pretty important, um, particularly, um, again, against car ownership and, and other modes where um, data sharing is not as, uh, as robust. Hi, everybody. Matt Doss, uh, former taxi commissioner from New York City and president of the International Association of Transportation Regulators. Um, it's good to see some friendly faces. I just had a question about municipal fleets and how that plays into the car sharing strategy. I think, um, you know, when you look at, um, you know, some of the, you know, the Green New Deal politicians and what they're looking to do, a lot of mayors now, including Mayor Adams in New York City, are looking to reduce the size of the city fleet. Um, how they do that remains to be seen. I'm sure there's internal things going on with Keith Kerman at DCAS and, and others, but like where, what car sharing and how it plays a role with reducing the municipal fleet, I think it could provide an opportunity for infrastructure and curb space. And um, you know, in particular, the federal government did it right with Uber and Lyft. They did a 48 state RFP where you, in order to be eligible to bid on it, you had to be a TNC in 48 states, right? So no brainer, right? Taxis couldn't apply for that, but they did get a $50 million contract so that the federal government doesn't have to buy vehicles for their employees and they can just take Ubers and Lyfts. So my thinking is, um, is this something that's being worked on um, at this point? Um, and not just, a, I'm not looking for a government answer necessarily too, but um, is this like an area where the car sharing companies may be looking at uh, in the future and is it realistic and is it possible that we could kind of get your foot in the door by saving them money, right? Because the big issue is the business model. If you're saving them on purchasing a ve more vehicles, you know, there's the value proposition there so that you might be able to become sustainable. So that... That's a great question, and, and the business model is not the issue for us. The financial savings is not the issue for us. Um, the issue on our end has been, and we've done it successfully. We worked with the city of Boulder. They had, it was actually our first uh, electric car share vehicle that was still owned by the city. We integrated it into our fleet. They still had it during the day use time. 
which put less pressure on extra cars they needed sitting around. It was also open to our members, most of whom do their driving in the evenings and the weekends. So there was no conflict there. It was an awesome model. They could have taken, they could have gone to town with it. The issue on our end is that you're usually dealing with multiple departments with different remits and their own budgets and a use it or lose it. And it, you know, you can have a, a city climate person whose goals are to reduce emissions and vehicles and switch over to electric you know, at an umbrella level, but then you're trying to get different departments to interconnect those dots. And um, at least in our experience, that has been the challenge in trying to get um, a city fleet reduction integrated with a car share program like ours. Yeah, I think Matt. Thanks for raising for raising that point. We didn't talk about that yet. It's it's exactly what what Peter just mentioned. This combination that works out very neatly often between business use of car sharing and private use of car sharing. So very often it's the kind of nine to five hours. I know we're post pandemic, but still, um, that uh, where businesses need the vehicles and on Saturday where people do their shopping or get something or visit friends on the weekend. So that is pretty much complementary if you if you manage how to run it. Now for the fleets, we've been for the past twenty years very specifically been targeting both government government businesses, government organizations, and private businesses for exactly that to substitute parts of their fleet. Now, I was, I was, I was last, year, last week I was in New York for a consulting project that I'm, I'm, I'm involved in there, and I was living in Long Island City, and I was walking, walking, to, walking through Astoria. I was staying in a hotel in Long Island City, walking through Astoria, and I was passing a, a sanitation department yard. And of course, you can never replace the special vehicles, meaning vehicles where there are toolkits inside, um, sanitation vehicles themselves, dump trucks, you can never replace those by car sharing vehicles, but then there was a whole load of a fleet of passenger vehicles for inspectors, for what I know, and not all of these vehicles do, not, do have a yellow light bar or blue light bar on top. So anything that's a standard vehicle or a standard van is something that can be very efficiently, if you can get around, work around the, 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 the part that Peter just mentioned, can be very efficiently be replaced in the economics and can work out, and this is the neat thing, it can be a win-win-win model. It's a win model for the, for the, for the government agency or the private business, it's a win model for the car sharing operator, and it is a win model for those people when, this, when the department is closed and they don't need these vehicles, then can be made, made accessible to everybody else. So it densifies your car sharing network. So that is really one of the models that we can grow this business on. And this is a, it's a super important point. I can just add quickly, we've been <clears throat> working with New York City since the Bloomberg administration on exactly that. Um, so one of our largest accounts is New York City government. And if you're an employee in the Department of Children and Families and you cannot get to visit your clients using Subway, you use Zipcart today. Um, and we do that with dozens of government entities um, today. We think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to grow and scale that. Um, but um, we've been uh, in that business for a dozen years or more. Uh, I totally agree.